Hi, everybody. It's Joe with Joe Dungan's talk show number nine. How about those opening credits, huh? I drew those myself. Never had one lesson. Amazing, right? I'm coming to you from the corner of my bedroom because I've been Zoom shamed lately. People are criticizing my background. I'm like, really? Really? Like, there's not enough on the internet for you to get angry about. Like, there's not enough trivial stuff as well as real important stuff to get angry about. You, you actually, this piece of you going, I know, let me write, you know, a 10,000 word, strongly worded letter about, you know, Joe Dungan's background on his Zoom. So seriously, you don't get that opportunity. I'm coming to you from the corner of my room. And uh, as you can see, the walls are painted uh, the color of Walter White's minivan. Okay, so you happy now? That's all you get. My guest today, oh my God, history. Joe Dungan's talk show history. This is going to be the first two-parter ever. And I knew as soon as I started talking to the guy, I'm going, we're not going to cram this into one episode. He's one of those guys. He's one of those guys. Do you know those, those guys that just like weird stuff just happens to them and they've got stories? He's that guy. He's got stories. He has an amazing career. He's one of those multi-potentialites. Again, does all this stuff. Graduated with degrees in film and advertising from USC. He was also an actor and still does acting. But his big thing, big thing he does now, he designs amusement parks. That's right. Amusement parks. That's what he does. It sounds like an awesome job. And he confirmed it. Right. It's an awesome job. And we talk about that. And then I just cut it off after a while because I'm going, okay, we got to make this into two parts. So the rest of it's coming later. But the, even this stuff now, I mean, this episode is great. There's it just the background the stuff, stories about some of the stumbling blocks along the way and some of the weird stuff that happens in just trying to make an amusement park and how he got into it. I'm fascinated by that, how people get into a certain line of work. So uh, we got that going on. And this is where I stopped talking. Jeffrey, thanks for joining Hi. me, bud. Thank you for having me. Jeffrey You're Brayer, welcome. welcome. No, I am very, very curious to talk to you about uh, about your life experience because you are the only person I've ever met who designs amusement parks. I do. Which, now, how basically, how does one get into this? Because you can't, I presume you can't major in this at, uh, at the local college? Uh, no, you really can't. Um, my degree from USC, from class of 2000, was uh, communication with emphasis in advertising and branding with a minor in film. So basically, I kind of use my degree every day because it's pretty much... Storytelling is basically what I do in a 3D space. So that's so. How much does storytelling play into the design of a of an amusement park? A lot, because at least in the theme park world, everything the public sees is considered part of the show, down to the theme trash can. And if all of a sudden you know you break away and realize that something isn't right, then we haven't done our job correctly. And so the transitions between lands should be smooth. The color palette should make sense. The wires should be hidden. It, it, it should be a completely immersive experience. And that's another reason like places like Disneyland where the walls at the berm are so tall so that you can't see the outside world. And that's the goal. Yeah, I mean, we'll get deep in the weeds on that because I'm sure there's all kinds of little things to contribute to the experience. I'm thinking of, for example, casinos how they right. deliberately design them so you get lost in them and you can't see the outside very well and there's no clocks and so on. Correct, and very uh, few windows. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's, it's done intentionally because they want you to stay and play, mm -hmm. have no idea what time it is, and, and have as much of your money go into their machine as possible and not even realize they've just dropped two, there, two grand in an hour. Yeah, and there's a certain dynamic that, that is at play in, in amusement parks. You, you want people to be so immersed in the experience that they forget about everything else in the universe. Correct. So you have these degrees, this degree with a major in branding and a minor in film. Right. How do you, how do you, what do you do right after college? Are you going into making movies? Are you, what's your plan? Well, after college? college, I graduated a really weird time. I graduated in 2000. And for years, I was a child actor. I did lots of TV shows and movies and voiceover and all, all, all different and, and commercials, you name it. I was a working actor from about 14 till about, I don't know, 35, 36, I'm 42 now. Still do some voiceover and producing my own projects these days. But more often than not, I was acting back in the day. And uh, 
actually, I graduated probably at the worst time that you could possibly graduate with the exception of maybe 2020, <laughs> which because that would, uh, the, the reason I would say is that is because when I graduated, um, my degree was in branding and I wanted to go into advertising and be a copywriter or an art director or creative director. Uh, the problem is when I graduated, it was the heart of the SAG strike. And so here's the problem. Um, I couldn't work for an ad firm because I was a SAG actor. So basically I'd be kind of, and it was the advertisers versus the actors in many cases that were having that SAG strike. So I'd be basically scabbing myself. Yeah, that's, wow, that's a situation. It was a mess. So how do you, how do you resolve that? How, what'd you do? I, start, I illustrated several children's books that I co-wrote. I had my own production enti entity for a little bit. Um, then 9-11 came. <laughs> You know, it's, it was just one of those things I was constantly reinventing myself, like kind of a serial entrepreneur my whole career by default. Now, was, uh, now you had to out of necessity in those occasions. I did. A lot of it was just that um, there wasn't work as an actor or then the ad world finally opened up. Things changed. But the big problem is in that world, it's a very, very regimented world in the ad world of basically um, you get pigeonholed particularly in the creative end of, of advertising that I, I've experienced. Uh, they try to um, stifle my creativity in lots of ways. So they say, they say this person, these people are just copywriters and these people are just illustrators or like what kind Correct. of are we talking about? I, they were saying that you could either be, uh, the problem was I'm a copywriter who can draw or an art director that can write. And they didn't like the fact that I was both of them. They said, you need to pick one. I said, but I do them both well. Um, and, and that made a big mess. They didn't like that. Well, it, they, it seems to me that, you know, they could hire a guy like you, pay you, you know, one and a half salaries and get two people, right? You would think that, but they were so tunnel minded that they didn't want that. I mean, later on, I was doing creative director work and I was overseeing you know, different people in the ad world. And I was able to kind of, but again, it was, that's one of the reasons I went to theme parks. Uh, theme parks, they don't care how many hats you wear. As long as the job gets done, great. So they, they love the fact that people are hyphenates in the, in the theme park world, because, you know, if you can write, you can draw, you have concepts and, and branding and storytelling and business development and all those things. Great. The more hats you wear, the more likely it was going to work. Because again, you're not just dealing with a 2D space of a movie screen. You're working with something that's completely immersive that you're standing in the middle of. So now let's 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 talk about how you transition to that world. Because when I don't see too many ads for hey, need a guy to design a theme park. You know, it's kind of like there aren't. It's kind of like <laughs> they Paramount don't really Studios exist. Saying, hey, we need a director for a 200 million dollar movie. I mean, if there's stuff behind the scenes. You got to be a player to get a job right. like this. How did you become a player? Well, the fact is, um, I'd always been interested in theme parks. I, I grew up in a Disney household. My parents have one of the largest Disney collections outside the Disney um, archives. Collections um, of what? Memorabilia? like Correct. All the way back to 1928 stuff? when Mickey was first created. Their entire home is Disney. I thought that everybody had a Disney collection. I just didn't realize that we were the only ones that were our kind. <laughs> uh, but we would go to conventions all the time and go to the parks and have people would give us things. And my parents have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Disney pieces displayed throughout their home. It's like a Disney museum. Wait, wait, to and this day? To this day. Where, where is their house? What part of town? Or should I, or in Pico Robertson in West Los Angeles. Really? Yeah. It's, it's, I, I, there are two old... retired teachers that just love Disney. And they, they, what's, the most, what's the most obscure thing that they have that make you think, oh man, I wish I had this? Uh, well, we have the face of an original Mickey Mouse watch. Uh, we also have a Mickey that's about yay big. That was before Walt Disney had actually fi finalized what the copyright of the character actually looked like officially, because there was no style guide or branding guide to after this character was done. You have a Mickey Mouse a Mickey prototype. Exactly. Who had no nose. And to this, on that one, Mickey had no nose. 
he's and we got the original this... Mickey Mouse watch. Was this one of the, the very first ones that Walt yeah. did? But it was also, and then we have this, like I said, this Mickey figurine that's about yay big and he has no nose. And it was only shortly thereafterwards that they decided, oh, we should probably, you know, have a, a, a style guide that Mickey looks the same all the way through. And, we also and, uh, own one of the Buzz Lightyear vehicles. Excuse me? One of the ride vehicles. You, you, your folks own one? Yes, I bought it on eBay years ago. Uh, it shipped it from Florida. It came in a trait, crate almost as big as an elephant. And where is it? Is it in the backyard? They just ride around in it or what? It's in the it's in the, the garage, and for we take it out for photo ops for parties. <laughs> wow! So on, on a so I, like I, I said, I always loved theme parks. So I, I when I was little, I wanted to be part of the magic. I wanted to create for Disney, and for whatever reason, I've never worked in house for Disney. Um, I've done a lot of third party creative work for them, but. Um, as far as theme parks, I mean, I met a couple people after graduating USC. And right after graduation, I was introduced to an organization called the TEA, which is the Themed Entertainment Association. And I get a lot of my work just word of mouth from that organization initially. Now, what does that organization do? It's kind of a social network for theme park developers, but it puts everybody on the same playing field. Because the cool thing is, uh, whether you're a writer, a ride designer, an architect, a money person, whatever it may be, people will come together. They'll have different, well, it's been different since COVID, but before that, we'd have different mixers at restaurants and different things around the city. People give out cards and you'd have independence and then you'd have the same people who represent Disney Imagineering and Universal Creative and all these other major organizations that would come together. So it was a good way of finding work or finding like-minded people. Wow. So you so you had friends because you 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 started by this part by saying I knew a couple of guys from school. And that's, you know, folks, the power of networking. Just exactly. That's you. why I went to USC, the University of Special Connections. It's all networking. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, you got to know a guy. OK, right. you got to know a guy. And uh, you knew a couple of guys. So a couple of people. Yeah. Now you have you have a background in at this point, you had a background in filmmaking, you had a background in branding. Yes. But you'd never actually made anything for a theme park. No, but it's interesting. As I said, I was an actor and the kind of my parway parlaying into theme parks was through an acting gig. Okay. Tell me more about that. Um, there's a company called N wave and they're from, they're out of Belgium and they're the, one of the top 3d animation companies for attractions for theme parks. And then you we go back, I don't know, 10, 12, 14 years ago, N-Wave decided to make their first 3D feature for theaters called Fly Me to the Moon. And it was about these two or three flies that snuck into Buzz Ald uh, Aldrin's helmet, and they have their own space adventure as flies. And it's, it's, it's a fun film. And I was a voiceover actor for several characters in the movie. And... Um, I befriended a lot of the people who were the creators of the animated feature because I knew that they were theme park 3D ride engineers or ride people. So aside from being a voice actor in the movie, I befriended all the producers on it and got to know them from other ways and then started working with them because uh, they were doing a lot of 3D and media for theme parks of which they need either voice people or, or writers or development people, a lot for like safety videos and stuff like that in the parks of which media had to be created before getting on an attraction. So that was your agenda at that time. It wasn't about being yes. rides. It was about, hey, if you need my voice for this thing, maybe you need my filmmaking talents for other aspects. Correct. Well, for whatever reason, I didn't get any more voiceover work out of it, but I started getting freelance writing gigs for the theme park industry. Now, a writing gig for the theme park industry would entail what? Uh, basically, in the theme park world, we do something called Blue Sky, of which Blue Sky is literally sky's the limit. Uh, any idea, It's kind of like the gong show for theme park developers. They put a bunch of creatives in a room, and they, have for, and they lock you up for like a weekend. And they occasionally throw you some food. And a bunch of maybe, you know, 5, 10, 20 creatives in a room. The room usually starts completely blank at the beginning of the blue sky session and two, three, four, five days later, uh, the whole room is covered in ideas. 
So whether it's a specific ride or a show or an attraction, sometimes a whole park might develop just basically of, you know, ideas being thrown out. And uh, a lot of companies like Disney and Universal and other companies would pay me for these blue sky sessions. And, and sometimes it would, they, that would be it. Thank you. And then other times, you know, oh, we love this idea. We're going to move forward with uh, uh, Jeffrey. Why don't you be a consultant or whatever on this particular attraction? And sometimes it would stop there and other times you would see it further. It's kind of interesting. You never really quite knew. And they would sort of build their teams of what they liked of what was developed in those blue sky sessions. So now when you consulted on these attractions, what, what exactly was your role? Were you saying, this is what the, this is, I'm a filmmaker, therefore I'm a storyteller. Therefore, when I see this attraction, I see the, the, the customer experience, you know, A, B, C, D, and E. Is that how that would go? Somewhat, but I would, my specifically, I'm a theme park show writer, which is a very specific job of writing the show. So it's not just writing the dialogue for an attraction, which I've done, or, or, or coming up with the theming of, of the attraction. Sometimes you're theming or writing the whole land, visually writing it. Like, okay, so this looks like a, a jungle forest. And what does a jungle forest look like on the outside of the building? What does a jungle forest look like on the inside of the building? How do the restrooms in this jungle forest look like? What do the eateries in this jungle forest have? What kind of foods are served in this? It, it's kind of telling, creating all of it. So it's it sounds like part screenwriting, but also part production design as well. Yes. So you, it's, 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 it encompasses a filmmaking background to be sure. Correct. Now, how did you, but how did you transition to that moment? Who was it who said, hey, this guy knows about movie making, therefore we trust him to make an attraction? Um, it was kind of trust, I guess it was. Yeah, because that's- They got to know me and, and they liked my ideas and they kept just throwing me a bone. What, what, well, why don't you write this script? Or why don't you take a stab at this attraction or, you know, X, Y, Z attraction is being rethemed. What kind of ideas do you have? Here's the box parameters that we have. How are you going to refill this box? And then I take it for all these endeavors that you've done, you get into theme park making, you're going, oh, this is the life. I mean, this employs yes. my creative side, all the, the love of Disney growing up and you get to play all day. It's, it's yeah. a lot of play. So it's a so you keep you keep making these ideas, you keep coming up with these attractions, and then I guess one begets another because you're networking well with these people. You've shown correct that network. And again, you know, because the TEA is such a small niche organization, everybody knows everybody in that group. So all of a sudden, you know, you make an attraction, even if it's in somewhere in Asia, word gets out. Oh, Jeffrey helped put together X Y Z. Oh, you know, let's find out what he's up to. Or and it's a, a lot. I'll find a lot of. Pro of these projects is team building because you never know one who's going to have a project or who's, who's going to be working for next or who's, if they're going to be working for you so again it's 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 finding like-minded people to kind of bring to your team uh, i've been uh, you you name the the attraction list and i've been on it and some never get past the list and and, and it, it's kind of just interesting but you know i i always have about five or six really close friends that I have kind of in my powwow group, so to speak, uh, you know, maybe someone who's a designer or an architect or a culinary person or, or someone who makes fake rocks really well or a, a, a park operator who actually works with the hiring and firing of people in the park and actually operates it. So it's kind of finding those kind of people uh, that I trust and who trust me. And it's, I, I get calls all the time. Hey, do you want to be on my short list? Sure. <laughs> well, you know, I want everybody short lived. What's interesting when you describe this world is it sounds like there isn't as rigid of a hierarchy as there is in other industries where there's like in advertising, you got the executive right. creative director and you've right. got the creative directors and the art directors and the copywriters right. do this and the studio artists do that and the proofreaders do this and so forth. Whereas you're like, well, this guy makes this, and that guy designs that, and he's designed that. How, who wants to be in charge? Show it. Who, you know, Jeffrey, you want to be in charge of this one? It sounds very like it, it can interest. be. I mean, although there can be hierarchies at companies like Disney and Universal, but some of the other theme park companies, there there are lots of them that you've never heard of, or that the world's never heard of, but are third party industries who you know do 
design rides and shows and attractions for the majors. And otherwise, sometimes they develop things for themselves or, or smaller parks. But it, in those worlds, it seems to be more free flowing. Now, do you find with that free flowing, obviously it, it opens itself up, it, it invites all kinds of creativity, but is there, a, is there a slight element of chaos? Do you think, well, I wish the person in charge of this would step up and do this so we can get on. There, there have been times of controlled chaos and there was a project recently I had to walk away from because unfortunately the guy that was helming the project um, was too busy trying to be everybody's friend and not focused enough on the, the output of the work that needed to get done. And sometimes you just gotta put your foot down and say, yes, this sounds great. The carpet's green moving on. But when you're, this particular person decided for, I don't know, four and a half weeks to have a debate on what the color of the carpet was in a building that wasn't built, in a building that didn't exist for a project that yet had funding. Yeah, that would, that would drive a, any sane person crazy. And I just said, pick the color of the carpet. Who cares? Right. And you can change your mind later, can't you? Like of course you can. There was no building. So there was no carpet. There was no plot of land. There was no money for this plot of land. They were seeking investors. So I, I mean, I had to walk away when it was getting into the minutia of the color of the carpet. He goes, but you know, there's going to be weddings here and it has to flow with this. And I'm like, let's just worry about the content of the, the bigger gestalt of the project as opposed to the minute detail of the carpeting because frankly, no one cares. Do you, do you find that creatives more so than other people have trouble with that sort of decision-making and working in teams together like that? I, yes. <laughs> like, um, how bad has it gotten? Was that, was that the worst example of that? that you no, I've seen worse. I, I've seen absolute what's, what's the worst that you can share? Um, or among the worst? Jeepers. Um, just not listening to each other. Lots of, I, I've seen chairs thrown, literally pencils thrown, um, tempers thrown, um, people storming in and out. One person broke a television. Wow. So there is some overlap between this and the entertainment industry. Oh yeah, it's it's well a lot of those people were entertainment people. Uh, talk about um, because you're talking about now you're getting into the nuts and bolts of how these places are designed. I'd like to know what are what are some of the because I've never been an architect, but I'm right. sure they're all and I haven't either. Huh. But still, you know enough about the considerations that have to be taken care right. of. For example, when you design a theme park, make sure there's enough bathrooms for everybody. Make sure the infrastructures right. are the plumbing and the electricity. I'm sure that. Right. Oh, you're going to build the. Uh, you're going to build this ride here. Okay, how many amps is this going to require? And is this? Do we have the power grid for it? And so on. Is it wide enough for an ambulance to get through in case a kid falls on his head? And so, right. on. what are some of those considerations that you've got to address that the rest of us don't even realize? Well, most parks uh, either have tunnels below the ground or a backstage that's very controlled uh, or even um, hidden paths within the rides that the public doesn't know are there. I've heard a few stories about Disneyland. Yes, um, there are hidden paths just on, twi on, on a Haunted Mansion, for instance, that are right. internal walls. And so, it's so dark in there, you can't really tell. And that's all right. And that's design. another reason. Why, and they're called dark rides for that reason. Because it's one, they're called dark rides in the, in the case of like Fantasyland and Haunted Mansion and Pirates because they use black light. That's why they're called dark rides. But also it's very controlled to what you can see and what you can't. Um, I remember one time on Indiana Jones, for instance, years ago, um, which is can be very thrilling and frightening in the dark but uh it broke down they had to turn the house lights up and all the magic was gone when i saw plastic snakes and something literally stapled to the walls <laughs> was there a side of you that go that was okay i gotta remember this for my next gig right and it will kind of works because you know if you're moving at that speed you, you see what looks maybe like a snake but literally it was like 
plywood and snake stack. You know, so it's 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 just like in the TV and film world. Everything is a facade. And there's only so much as far as quote on the quote the camera is going to see, or there's so much only that the public's going to see. And as soon as it's out of frame or out of public range, it, it turns back into a warehouse space. Now, now speaking of Disneyland. I know you've done some work for Disney. Did you do any work on the Disneyland theme park even after it was, after it was built, obviously? It's built one no, time ago. I had done some stuff for um, Disneyland Paris as well as uh, Tokyo Disneyland and consulting for, for brand development and stuff and retooling of stuff for their foreign parks, but not very much for their American parks. Now, this begs a lot of questions. Did you, how much were you hemmed in by the way Disneyland and Disney World had been built? Did the powers that be come to you and say, look, we want it just like this, but different? Or did they just open up, you know, the sky's the limit, do whatever you want? How did that marriage come about? A lot of it is based on IP and certain things that they're pushing for. Um, it depended on how much, cre how creative they wanted to be. And like I said, I've always been kind of a third party person. They're brought in for ideas on different projects, but as opposed to being in-house, which gave me a little bit more flexibility, but it it's, it is kind of interesting. A lot of times it was this particular attraction worked well in California. Let's make a cookie cutter version of it. I personally am not a huge fan of the cookie cutter attractions because it's a variation on a theme. Maybe there's a slight story difference, but you're basically, you know, making the same attraction elsewhere. When you, I, I like projects that are brand new from the beginning that gives me a chance or the team that I'm working with to, to create something new that hasn't been done before, uh, perhaps, perhaps a, a ride technology that's never been used before or a new patent. That, those are the things I find really exciting. Well, now, you, in, when you worked on Disneyland Paris, were there some things that Parisians just didn't get about American version of Disney entertainment? Well, they had to do lots of changes initially. Uh, one of the things was Disneyland doesn't have any alcohol in their park. Uh, ironically, that's changing there now that the reopening of the pandemic, I think that people realize people need a drink. And for the first time ever, the Blue Bayou is going to have alcohol starting in a few days, according to yesterday's paper. Uh, but for the longest time, um, that was a, a taboo. There was no alcohol in Disney parks. And so when they first opened Disneyland Paris, uh, originally it was Euro Disney. That was that was a big mess. They had to change the name quickly after opening because France thought of themselves as a separate entity from Europe and they resented the fact that it was called Euro Disney. They had to eventually rebrand the whole place and make it Disneyland Paris. Is, is, but the other is there a side problem, of you that thinks how come they didn't figure this out before they opened? I wasn't on those committees, so it didn't make a difference to me. No, uh, but, like but said, still, I was, isn't there a side of you? You would think that they would have wondered that they should have done local more research. Of course they should have. They didn't yeah. though. And for a long time people refused to go there. And it was having major money problems. Eventually, when they rebranded it and changed the name, and all of a sudden, now it's one of the most sought-out destinations in France, more than the Eiffel Tower. But for, it took a long time to get there. And another problem was, um, in their research, they found that French people, uh, I don't know where they got their research from, uh, didn't like breakfast. So they had very few breakfast options. And it turned out they were big on having kind of brunch. So that all had to change. They also were having no alcohol in the park. France and wine go hand in hand. I mean, it was a, it, not, it wasn't me. I mean, I didn't have anything to do with, with all that stuff. I was do, doing more behind the scenes branding things for them. But uh, you, you would have thought if they're building a park of that magnitude that they would have done more research. But again, I wasn't on the research team. So I, I, I have I have nothing to, to say about that. But you you have an awfully enviable job as a third party consultant to come in and say, well, here are my ideas. You know, take them or leave them. I have some expertise. I would do this, this, and that. But you know, do what you want. Do you what What are some of the more inventive ideas that you've come up with that have, have been implemented that turned out to be hits? Um, well, it's really interesting. There was one park I was working on called Digital Prism with an M, which was in Seoul, Korea. Uh, once I started working on the project, it became a digital prison with an N. Um, the thing is, um, I was developing a three-story indoor park for South Korea. The first floor was going to be ancient Egypt. But this is funny. They wanted the first floor to be the past. They wanted the second floor to be the present. And they wanted the third floor to be 
the future. I don't know what they were smoking or not when they developed this park because I got the third floor was outer space. That was the future. I got that the first floor was ancient Egypt. That was the past. But what do you think they had for the present on the second floor? Um, the Aztec jungle. Exactly. I'm, I'm like, all right, you're paying you're paying me to develop this for you. So there you go. <laughs> wow. That okay. Now when they say develop the Aztec jungle, what what is was this you going back to say, okay, if I designed an Aztec jungle indoors, what would it look like? Where would the bathrooms be? Where would the restaurant be? And so forth. And it was all rides and shows and attractions, and I made it very campy. Um and try to make it you know, today, but being as that junk, it made no sense. <laughs> is, is the park still there? Well, here's the thing. So everything was set to go. Um, it, they were building a new, the theme park was going to be the hub of this brand new planned community. It was going to be the theme park and there was going to be housing radiating after, out of it and buildings and, and infrastructure. And there were going to be, and it was kind of in this remote forest area where they were going to build this. So they started building it. They made this big hole in the ground and started doing with this landfill and all this other stuff. In the meantime, they were going to have bullet trains coming from four different areas in to this area for the theme park and for the whole plan community that was going to be radiating off of it. Well, shortly, two or three months into the project, there was a rail strike of which the theme park company owned the trains that were on the tracks the South Korean government owned the train tracks themselves. So they mm. wouldn't allow the trains to come in for construction because of the fact that there was this rail strike. Guess what? The rail strike is still going on to this day. How, how long are we talking? 10 years, there's still a hole in the ground and nothing's been made. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah, that's- so I have a really successful, beautiful, 3D renderings and concepts for a park that's a hole in the ground. They never finished it. So now, I mean, is it going to happen eventually or have they just- Who knows? I got paid long ago. I don't care. <laughs> maybe it'll get made, maybe it won't be. But that's what the projects happen like that all the time. So that's, that was, that's my next question. When you come in to work on something, there's no guarantee it's going to get made. That's correct. Like, what, are we talking like 50-50? Are we talking most get made, most don't get made? I was talking to a theme park designer the other day. He said, "Of the uh, say he goes out for a bid, I don't know, for different projects and just the number he threw out was 400. Say he goes out for 400 jobs and he's one of the top theme park designers in the world, friend of mine. If he gets 23 of those 400 jobs, he's bad in 500. Wow. No, it's not because the, there's fierce competition for the work. It's because sometimes these things just don't even get off the ground. Yes, because things change. Sometimes egos control things. Sometimes people claim they have the money for certain things. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes corporate levels, corporate hierarchies change things along the way. Yeah, things will start and stop and start and stop and start and stop again. And sometimes they actually come to fruition. And sometimes they're a beautiful storyboard. Huh. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of things could go wrong in addition to funding. I'm also wondering, in addition to state, federal, and local governments intervening, saying, well, oh, you know, absolutely. Zoning, we this, you know, this is a, it's going to clog traffic, it's going to cause pollution, it's going to cause this, that, and the other. How often does that intervene? All the time. And, and I would say, I would guess multiple times along the way. Yes. You so have like all these outside organizations, you know, who are wildlife people or the conservation people or you know, they don't want their view blocked in the, in the neighborhood or it's it, ever if, if they have an excuse to find, they will find one. Now, how much of it is, I'm wondering what the motivations are behind this, because I'm sure in the case of homeowners, it's, it's just, this is our NIMBYs, you know, we don't want this here, just go. In our away. backyard, of course not. Yeah. But then again, it's only going to raise their property values in a huge way and, and regentrify it and, and bring in new stores and family oriented things to do and restaurants and everything else, but I can't tell you how many people find ways into, and then you have all these stupid meetings, you know, with city council and all these, you know, people who barely have teeth who wander up, oh, you're taking up my land and, 
it's a mess. Now, of all these uh, local and state and county and federal level uh, bureaucracies and interferences and such, how many of them to you are meritorious? I mean, are there things that happen where you say, oh my God, I didn't think of that. He's right, this is gonna destroy, this is gonna set off an earthquake on the San Andreas Fault or whatever. Or how much of it is usually just idiocy? 95% of it's idiocy. Really? Yeah. People wow. just like to hear themselves talk. And if they, 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 they don't, a lot of people just don't want change. What's, what's the dumbest excuse you've ever heard or among the dumbest? What's the one that made you, because you seem like a very even keeled guy. What made the you most just part. lose your mind and throw, break a TV? I, I never threw the TV, but. I know, um, you, I know you wouldn't, but what, what made you just want to just chuck it all and, 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 and split? Mm, let me think for a second. That's a good question. Um, both one woman claimed it was going to ruin her hair. <laughs> a theme park was going to ruin her hair. Correct. Because you... of all the extra smog and pollution and everything else, it's just going to, it was going to cause it to fray up and cause <laughs> problems. And she was going to have to buy <laughs> copious amounts of Aquanet to hold it in place. A theme park. True. True. <laughs> Was I right or was I right? I was totally right, right? Is that guy a trip or what? And yes, there is more. Wait till you hear the Spider-Man story. He wasn't in Spider-Man, but he got something in Spider-Man. And how he did it, it's just one of those things. It's going to make you say, I got to take advantage of every opportunity because you never know how stuff is going to happen. And then there's an urban legend. There's a site called Urban Legends where they talk about urban legends. He's in one of those urban legends. He became an urban legend as a child. And not only that, he talks about how he told other people that he was a subject of an urban legend. That story alone is interesting. And more stuff. It, it's, it's astonishing. Just the stuff, the brushes with greatness. The, 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 the way he's kind of bounced around society and life and all these wild amazing things happen to him and he's got this sunny disposition about the whole thing a uh, wonderful fellow you're not going to want to miss it i need to change my zoom background <laughs>